Hello everyone, a uh, very warm welcome to the Hellenic Center. I'm Naiya Kumaki, I'm the director of the Hellenic Center, and it's a great pleasure to be hosting tonight's talk with uh, artist and researcher Ioana Kotelaraki in conversation with publisher Stuart Smith. Uh, the talk is entitled The Truth is in the Soil, a photographic exploration of ancestral mourning rituals, trauma and visuality in Greece. So, The Truth is in the Soil is Ioana's first monograph, published by Ghost Books in 2022, and it follows a long exploration of the subject of grief as an elegy of, um, to your father, as an elegy to Ioana's father, and the dying tradition of mourning in Greece. After her personal loss, uh, her own grieving process became the lens through which she investigates that collective grieving process. Um, in Greek society, and the intersection of ancestral rituals, private trauma, and the passage of time, which is obviously further inspired here by the very last communities of mourners on the Mani Peninsula in the Peloponnese, as the Doliens are of a dying tradition. The conversation with uh, Stuart Smith will touch upon the ways um, of making and juxtaposing the artist's own challenges in grieving with her cultures past, where mourning was a more open and performative process. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers with more detail. So Ioana Sekelaraki is a Greek visual artist and researcher. Her work investigates the relationship between collective cultural memory and fiction. She's a graduate of journalism with an MA in photography from the Royal College of Art and an MA in cultural studies. Following her interest in interdisciplinary critical theory, in relation to visual arts, um, she was awarded an international scholarship for undertaking her PhD at RMIT University. She is the recipient of several awards, including the Royal Photographic Society Bursary Award in 2018. She was a winner of a Sony World Photography Award in 2020. In 2019, she was awarded with a Reminders Photography Stronghold Grant in Tokyo and the International Photography Grant Creative Prize and in 2021 received federal funding from Arts Council England. Nominations include also the Ingrid Morad Award by Magnum Foundation in USA, the Prix S uh, HSBU, and the Prix Le Valois and the Prix Bois of in France. Um, Iona's work has been exhibited internationally in art festivals and galleries with recent solo shows in Tokyo, Melbourne, Belfast, Braga, Greece and Berlin. Her projects have been featured in many magazines such as, uh, and, and newspapers such as also the New Yorker, Time, Aesthetica and Wallpaper and journals uh, here in the UK including The Guardian, Financial Times and Deutsche Welle in Germany. Her work has been acquired by the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, LACMA. Now, Stuart Smith is the director, I googled that, sorry. I'm sure you sorry. have a massive CV, but I only have a few lines. So, Stuart Smith, <laughs> very modest. Stuart Smith is the director and co-founder of Ghost Books. He has been designing since the late 1980s and he established Smith in 1994. And Stuart has become renowned for his specialization in typography and award-winning photo books. So first, Ioana will start with a short presentation of the project and after that, the two will be in conversation. You will also have the opportunity to participate in the Q&A just after, so please hold your questions until that time. Ioana's book, The Truth is in the Soil, will be on sale afterwards, and you'll have the opportunity, apart from the actual book, uh, that is a general retail availability, to, have, to see and perhaps have a limited edition book that includes uh, a print uh, inside. So after the event, we will also serve drinks at the bar for about an hour, where you can see the book or mingle, continue your conversation there. Some practicalities, if you do hear a fire alarm, you have to run out run. <laughs> and go across the pavement from the main door where you entered. And then the uh, last thing to do is please remember to put your phones on silent. <coughs> and join me in a very warm round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. So, hello everyone. That was an amazing introduction, Maria, very extensive, and I'm sure you, you set up the page for what we'll be speaking about today. 
Um, it's a great honor to be here. I mean, I've come all the way from Australia where I currently live, so please bear with me today. It's, uh, I'm also on jet lag. Um, but uh, it's, it's really a great opportunity to also be speaking about the work with Stuart. It's the first time we're doing this together. And you have to consider that the, the book came out two years ago, and The Truth in the Soil is really a long-term exploration uh, that uh, began seven years ago. So in a way, it has been a project that um, is foundational for my own practice, as after the loss of my father, it kind of allowed me uh, to, to really delve into um, a personal, kind of deep personal connection to my own practice, but also a creative experimentation that I would say kind of changed my practice forever. Um, it's a work that began as a personal story, uh, transformed into a kind of documentary project, and later on, uh, after my time at the Royal College of Art, kind of really became um, a creative endeavor. Um, that allowed me to use different processes deriving from the kind of real spaces within my practice towards so more kind of imaginative and open approaches uh, to visual arts. So, Naya very briefly mentioned that you know, my background is, is in journalism and cultural studies. I came into photography a bit later. Um, and actually this has allowed me to look into photography contrary to my background in journalism in a very different manner from the very start. I would say that um, it all somehow began with writing and a series of projects that I was working around cultural development after my first master's. And alongside those I began making images and really focusing at the very start on memory and territory and historical landscapes. Um, in the Balkans with a focus, uh, I think back then, more in architectural ruins. And um, I started being really perplexed by photography in the sense of how I wasn't really interested from the very start into looking at photography as a medium that somehow justifies reality. But I wanted to kind of imagine through images. Uh, and the more I started kind of delving into theory of photography and ways of seeing and working with images, it became more and more interesting to me in terms of how photography is so closely related to death and loss. It is a medium that really kind of allows for these ideas of absence to become present through the work. And it's always about you know, what has been and what will never be again but through the image. It is a record of somehow an act of disappearance that become present through the photographic work. So I think these very first works, they were not really necessarily belonging to any projects, but they were kind of creative exercise for me to also to allow me to start creating these spaces within my practice and potentially, you know, building up a visual language that it was all about staying longer with this kind of mystery and ambiguity and ambivalence. Um, in the work. Interestingly, these images that are between, I would say, 2015 and 2017, they came uh, to become part of the book as well. Um, so I would say that The Truth in the Soul, even if it has been a very kind of concrete project, um, it has also, it also kept on remaining open throughout the time I was making this work, and I think this kind of comes also from the idea that this body of work is really developed um, developed as a potentially not, not as a response but as a constant question of what it is to deal with mourning, which is an open ended process without resolution eventually. And the project did begin um, after the loss of my father, so this, this very significant event really brought me back home in Greece. And in relation to the ways I was trying to contextualize, you know, ideas around. This, this relationship between memory, fantasy, and loss in my practice, this actually started becoming a project I was engaging with. You have to imagine that, I mean, I was a Greek woman in my late 20s, returning back home after a decade of having been away. And then I began thinking of how I would position myself in relation to my own family and traditions. And there was a constant struggle with this kind of process in the sense that obviously I had left home for a while, but also I think uh, my family had never been so traditional. Uh, however, I think death is a very interesting thing because 
it is a wrap within one's identity and also cultural identity. Uh, I think there's always a process of seeking for a way to go through it. Um, and I started within that context being really interested in the kind of sociocultural um, understanding of my country. And this, this is an image of my mother. So my mom turned religious after the death of my father, and that was a very kind of big change within our families. But it also allowed me to kind of come closer to her in the sense that we were both sharing this experience of loss, but in such different ways. And I began actually um, looking into all the kind of day-to-day -day rituals as well as, you know, kind of daily routine of my mother and how this kind of transformation in her was allowing her to grieve. Um, here we see actually one of the first uh, dummy books I ever made um, that kind of departs from, I would say, a vocabulary of, of understanding loss in Greece. Um, we see here just one of the spreads that shows um, kind of multiple, this typology of um, mini chapels that are actually built, I think not only in Greece, but in other places in the Mediterranean as well, like on the side of the road or in the garden of someone when a person is lost. And actually my mom, after the death of my father, built with her own hands a chapel in our garden, a small chapel. So. I started thinking a lot about labor and the process of how we engage, you know, when we, we constantly potentially perform also while grieving and what this means for each individual, but also how it's a collective process in her case. And I think obviously, you know, a project, now these things are kind of narrated in a certain manner, but there is also very unconscious kind of various unconscious encounters through the work. Um, while being made. Eventually this, this mini book was kind of designed to be almost like a prayer book uh, that towards the end of it we had all the, um, the things my mom was telling herself in terms of how she's going through her grieving. Um, eventually coming back into you know Greece that has been a constant encounter and kind of inspiration in my practice. Um, it has allowed me I suppose to construct this this space of fantasy and laws that is constantly transformative through those images. And um, obviously I've been looking back into my own culture and identity, and I think we all have those kind of signifiers that they link us back to, you know, to where we come from and what we kind of sometimes remember forgetfully through the process of you know, our own cultural traditions. Um, eventually there are symbols that are not necessarily universal, but they, they kept on coming back in my own practice, for instance, the pomegranate looking back into Greek mythology and how it's the, the fruit of life and rebirth, featuring in myths as the ones of the underworld. And eventually how these things, you know, are kind of allegorical spaces. They're, they're a way of staging something within the practice. Um, and as you can, you can tell, this, this part of the work is, is really documentary and local medium format photography, but it was a very necessary part and step for me in order to start thinking forward in terms of how I will further engage with the making of this project. And I think it, another trigger throughout the process was the um, actual orthodox funeral of my dad. Um, in the book, um, we have a series of writings that I developed during my time at the Royal College of Arts, and they're kind of pictocritical writings, but the first one begins with me um, coming back home from abroad in Greece and seeing my father in the coffin, an open coffin, all dressed up in our living room. And this was the first time that I actually saw in Greece people moving. So there was this idea of how this, I mean, obviously something I will never forget, but it's also something that I started being um, very triggered by and very uneasy with. Uh, in terms of how this public process of grieving that I had never encountered uh, was taking place in such a, such a private moment and what that meant and how I would potentially include or exclude myself from it. So there were a lot of questions there and I think uh, during the funeral of my father um, this mourning process kind of took place extensively and uh, ladies from the neighborhood as well as um, actually one of my aunts 
started performing what we call the fake songs and mirrologia, deriving from the word mirror that translates as fake in Greek and logos that is speech. And um, it was a very, very intense process. Um, so, having not participated in that, but having, you know, having been there mm -hmm. and having kept those memories with me, I think that um, this type of experience obviously opened opened this narrative from the personal loss to what what Greece was doing to me while I was mourning. So actually, right after that, I started researching more and more the mirrologia, and I started looking into the Mani Peninsula of Greece uh, in the Peloponnese, where I had heard that some of the last mourners performing this type of rituals uh, were still living. Very briefly, I mean, the first kind of encounter we have uh, in history of art, um, and civilization in general from, from the fate songs are back in kind of early proto-geometric period of kind of 11th century BC, so it's, it's really, really ancient times. They were always, uh, in most of the cases, actually performed by women, older women, that they were considering that a kind of social duty. Um, and they were sung in, in fixed intervals um, at the wake, uh, during the funeral procession, and then at the tomb. Um, what took me to Mani uh, was, was a kind of curiosity to spend time with those women, but without eventually having a clear purpose in terms of how this you know, would come back into the work. Um, during that period of time, I had some support from the Royal Photographic Society in terms of like, engaging with this aspect of collective mourning in my work. So, um, I stayed in Mani for a few weeks and I did back and forth several trips. Here we see one of the, the funerals I attended and I was allowed to also record part of the, the neurologia in Sukari village in Mani. And this is a very small selection of just images that were made. Um, and there was this, this kind of documentary portraiture that took place uh, which got me thinking um, until this, this kind of image, which is called Nix, um, came, came through through the, the editing. And this was an image that was key for me in terms of moving forward with this project in the sense that I started being really interested in how the language of mourning remains always open and ungrounded and how I was very trapped into this essence of documentary that I was very interested in. But at the same time, I wasn't, I wasn't quite um, I wasn't feeling that that was what this project had to bring forth for my own narrative and interest as a visual artist. So I think this image was, was a kind of pivotal, kind of transformative moment because I allowed myself to look into this, this process of making and thinking around death more openly and, and you know, how death is eventually a kind of open-ended cultural enigma that has both subjective and objective interpretations and this idea of the silhouette of a woman that you know you can't really recognize and she's not necessarily turning her back to you but she's turning towards that other world that I was kind of attempting to to echo through my practice. So eventually um, these first images of the actual mourners, I, I started kind of experimenting with. I started thinking about the silhouette, uh, ways of working around ideas of rapture um, that kind of create these multiple encounters through the work. And eventually also thinking again that this project was not just about loss, but it was also about connection. I think we all make work you know, to step out from our own walls and eventually, you know, open up the practice and the discussion to... It's a work about Greece, but everyone has a story of death and, and ways of coping with death or mourning to share. And I think those images started really being more, more open in terms of interpreting those ideas. Um, so, eventually I would say that um, this started becoming kind of motive and, and a pattern within the work. And it was about this kind of irreversible effect of loss and ways of working, you know, with, with both, both mourning and the photographic process for disordering those memories. I mean, mourning is a process that is, it's all about 
layering and reiterating and kind of reimagining throughout the way. There's so much that, that we forget and that is reminders of. Um, but there is so much also that is not within those images and they just echo a certain sort of absence that we make up in terms of how we move forward with the making. So I think a big, big part of those works um, was about that and I think this influenced my practice even further on in terms of how I think with photography and uh, kind of processes around the photographic and how eventually for me this these silhouettes became somehow vehicles for for mourning towards this, this kind of Paris ideals of vitality, prosperity and belonging that this project kind of attempts to speak about. So um, I will leave this here. I think this was um, was an introduction uh, in terms of how, you know, narrative-wise as well as in terms of my own Photographic processes, you have to imagine that you know this has been a project of five years, so it's changed a lot. I think that was quite important um, to, to share because it has been it has been a continuous conversation with Stu as well, um, in terms of how we kind of looked at the first images and then we came back to kind of follow up uh, with the work and how the book actually allows to bring all those images together. <coughs> in a certain way. Yeah, we started a conversation about <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> Hang on. Let me just see. My phone will ring, so don't worry. How past you talk half an hour, not 15 minutes. Sorry. <laughs> what do you like to say? What do you like to say? So I remember the first time we met at your office in London. And I remember coming with a series of very dark landscapes and a very brief story around the project. And I remember that you said, you know, that's interesting, let's keep on talking. And then, yeah. Right. So, um, actually, I was introduced to you by Anna, which is my now wife. Um, and you showed me a series of pictures, mostly. Uh, they started off with a documentary which you saw, The Black and White. Can I turn you down one? <laughs> oh, it's my turn around. All proportional, there we go. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> I'm, I'm used to projecting, so I, uh, especially at home with Mickey, I have to project to stop him. Anyway, um, sorry, don't go now. I'm just getting used to it, so hold on, I've just been sitting here. And, uh, so, you, I'm getting lost again, but you came in. You said to me, you showed it to somebody else, another publisher, and he said, no, it's not for me. But the, the real thing is it wasn't for me either. The, the other publisher was down, I wasn't going to mention it, but I mentioned it. Down with this. But the point was, you started doing documentary pictures, and we put them in the book, and we put them at the beginning before the title page, and the point was to show you that it was the starting point for your photography that we talked about. But they weren't... Documentary photography is a difficult, a difficult thing to do. And I think you started, right, who's that? <laughs> <coughs> you better answer it quickly. Um, got to phone me again, you see, I know the phone thing. So documentary photography is a difficult thing, and it started by being, you had quite a few portraits that we didn't put in, didn't we? That I, I felt, that the one with the two ladies, did we put them in? We, we did select, like, um, a very, very few images from the documentary, and that's actually quite interesting in terms of how not pressing, you know, what was important to the work at that stage, but then really looking into how we would actually edit the book with a final edit of the sure that. We have very few documentary images in the book. Yeah, I think we started with 30, and we ended up with 8. And the, the reason was, it was that they weren't, it wasn't what the project was about. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not that they weren't good. They weren't Brilliant, and I can see why Dowie said no. It's not, it wasn't that. It was actually that I was looking for something that said more. Mm -hmm. And because I've looked at a lot of photography, I get to a point where I just, I've seen it. Um, you know, when you talk about uh, death and the death of your father and this, um, we get sent at BOSS many uh, uh, projects that people do, and they, um, they unfortunately design it themselves. So once you get past that, then I can actually put the pictures. 
There's most photographers, by the way, even with their mates, do terrible design of books. So <laughs> if anybody out there wants to do it, don't design your own book. Just send me a set of pictures and it'll be, um, it'll save you a lot of time and money and angst. And don't deliberate over your design either, because you're going to, I was going to say fuck it up, but you're going to ruin it. So um, don't. Um, oh, I've got off the, off the board again. I've lost the board. It's the truth. So, like, that's something I've always appreciated with, with Stu, you know, when. But you wouldn't like something or you would think that something doesn't work out. It was not about, you know, it was really about communicating that and then we were... Okay. It was about the fact of li life and death. And I get sent projects, I got sent one the other day, and it was of somebody's father, and we photographed them through their whole demise, right to the end. And I thought, oh, jeez, you know, this seemed like me. This is my life now, I'm entering that point. And you talked about your father, because your father was a lot older than your mother, wasn't he? Yes. So how much older was he? So my parents uh, have, like, have, yeah, 22 years difference. So, um, just to give you, uh, I'm, I'm, my, my wife is 20, uh, one years younger than me, and we've got a son and he's four. It's, um, and I can, you talked about your dad taking or picking you up from your school and something saying, oh, I see your grandfather's company, which your father. Yeah. And it's having somebody that's older is, is, a, is something that I've come to understand. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that plays on you in the morning with him and going back over. Something that's private because, of course, it culturally that's something different. I'm going off the board a bit. But what I saw in the pictures was the starting point, and that's m more of what you showed me at the beginning. And then I think you came back to see me two or three times. Yes. And each time, I wasn't saying that I was going to do it, but I just uh, was, you know, where, we, where are you going with this? But a lot of the pictures that you did are transitions between documentary and the other pictures that you're doing, which is the uh, ones where you manipulate. In, in fact, I don't even know what you've done, which ones you manipulated or how you did it. But the part is that I don't really, um, I'm not really interested in that, I'm interested in the image. I also don't know why it's called The Truth is in the Soil, but I don't know most of these questions to do with, um, with the books that I do, because I just, I mean, it's visually that mm -hmm. really interests me. I, the thing I can say, because I'm wishing wrong, about um, Iona's work is you, in towards the end, you put pictures that you will lean into your next yes. style. And I think your type of work will, it'll be one big piece of work, but different strands as you go through it. Because mm -hmm. they each have a piece that you then explore. Which you were lucky because you found your thing quite early. This is making a funny feedback thing. Yeah. Isn't it? That is, yeah. is it too close? But if I say that, is it all the speaker? Yeah. Is it? Uh, okay. um, so that's what I find interesting in photographers that come to see me is what are they doing that is different from that I haven't seen? And I've been around a bit. You wouldn't believe it, but I, you know, I was born a, a while ago. And um, a bit like Benjamin Button, you know, I've seen so many people's work and I've kind of seen it all. What I'm looking for is something that is different. And with photography, it's an easy thing to do because everybody takes pictures, especially with the phones now. And Oh, I don't know what the percentage that I would think. It might be nice to my point seven. Most pictures are utter rubbish. <laughs> and it's fine. So, but when you're trying to do a project and you're trying to show something, it's a different, it's a different kettle of fish. So what I'm looking for is something that moves me or makes me look at things differently. I was rooted in photojournalism, and you were started in that, but it took shift, and you realised that actually photojournalism was awesome for you. So, um, do you want to say some more now? Mm -hmm. cool. yeah, yeah. No, definitely, thank you for sharing. Like, from my perspective, just to say that, you know, obviously, and I mentioned that in the beginning, you know, I was, I was learning as I was going, mm -hmm. and it was transformative for me. And having people like you, that's why I mentioned the honesty, because you speak to so many people in the industry, and, you know, they all have their feedback or their own, you know, interests. and. I felt, as you said, I spoke to other publishers and stuff, and I think the type of conversations we had as the project was kind of being developed and changing, they were, they were very helpful for me. 
it really, it really kind of helped me reflect in terms of what direction I was going. And it's true that it's, it's kind of frustrating, you know, we never knew if we were going to make a book, till we actually did. Right. So, but I think sometimes it is all about those conversations, and then eventually the book happened. I remember <coughs> it was after the Sony World Photography Award that we kind of really spoke and we said, you know, let's, let's try to, to make the book. And actually the book was made uh, through a Kickstarter. So that was also a very important part of the process because, as you, you must know, uh, many of you that might have tried to, you know, engage with publishing, that um, the cost of a really high quality, you know, very nicely printed um, photography book costs a lot. So uh, we did a successful, kind of successful Kickstarter. I don't remember. <laughs> I do, because um, <laughs> that was really, yeah. I, a lot of people, yeah, by the way, important. they hate Kickstarter, they hate doing it, because they think, you know, you're badgering people, but you're actually just asking for a pre-sale. Mm -hmm. Just to buy the book, we're not asking for free money. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't have a problem with it, but uh, I know that some publishers look down on it. Uh, but it's, it's happens a lot more now, because it's much more difficult to produce a book of quality, and it, it costs a, a, a lot of money. It just it just does, and we don't print in we print in Italy, not in uh, China. Where it, well, it used to be a lot cheaper, but I don't think it is so much now. But um, you you have to get you have to get the funding, and the only way is either you're going to have um, is a Kickstarter. Well, actually, we did it before his, his grandmother died, left him the money, so we were able to do it that way. But you know, there are ways and ways, but. Um, yeah. No, definitely. It was also it was an important part of actually making the project, you know, happen. Because I think there are so many amazing works out there and it's just impossible to just find the funding to make a book. So kind of what you mentioned also that towards the end of the book we're kind of leading um, towards the next chapter of this work. And we also kind of always thought that the end of the book might be the beginning of something else. So, um, towards the end of the book, you will see many images that kind of derive from the archive of my father that this is the next chapter of the work. So, I've been working, um, I mean, it's been almost three years now, and it's been a very big part of my research around archives for my PhD as well. I've been working on the archive of my dad that was actually found after his death, and then the reveal of another family that my dad had. So, it's something I was recently discussing that um, as much uneasy the truth is in the soul has been, it was it was a very different project because no matter how much uncertainty there is around death, then the death had, had happened. Whereas I feel that this chapter of the work is just um, is very complicated in terms of intimacy and family narratives and this idea of the lack of absolute knowledge. Uh, in terms of, you know, this project is really about the father and then the father is not anymore there and there is something new that generates an entire new universe of images and... Um, so yeah, definitely it's been, it's been interesting we actually included that. I think, I think that the difference is, because again, I can't tell you how many people send me family archives uh, and look at their family pictures and it's... I could show you mine. That, that was interesting. You know, but what you do is you then use them as the starting point and you put it into something else and that changes things. And that, that then makes it interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. If you just use them as static images uh, and then moved on to something else, it starts to get a bit, I just, it just gets a bit samey. And everybody finds their fact that, that these pictures after the parents die and they find these things and they think they mean something. But they do to them. But it's very difficult to make the step to make the audience believe and look at it too. And that's the hardest part. Otherwise, it, or you do the book for yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, sweet. But it doesn't interest me. I'm looking at something that's going to do something different for me. Um, and some of your pictures in the book, they are just straight pictures. I, again, I'm not even sure which ones of those are. But um, it doesn't really matter. What I there was a there was a thing that didn't surprise me, the documentary ones about these collections used to collect pictures. And the person asked him, the filmmaker said, and tell me about this picture. And he said, It's called I Like It. <laughs> and I liked the pictures. 
they did something, and I believe that I have an eye for something, and that's it. You know, whenever I do books, it's whether I like it or not. I don't go to the committee and ask everybody, should we do this book? I just think, oh, I like this. We're going to do it. And that's the end of the story. Mm. It's, a, it's just a yes or no. And then what happens is, it's a collaboration, and I'm not uh, a digital monkey. I don't just do the book and you give it to me and I just put it in and you tell me what pictures to go in. The collaboration between you and me and working it through is really important. In fact, if we didn't have the collaboration, I wouldn't be doing publishing, because it doesn't interest me at all. What interests me is this bit. In fact, when I've done the book, I have no interest in selling it. I don't know if it sells or not. It's, again, I have other people that do that. Mm -hmm. uh, this process is infinitely fascinating, and I have enough energy to keep on with that until I don't. But um, I've lost the point. There was it was as an end point, and it just disappeared. <laughs> like a <puppy's> <laughs> <coughs> But no, you, you said, like, yeah, you said really, I mean, that's, that's interesting because... You know, this project, everyone was like, when is it going to end? And, you know, has it ended? I'm not quite sure. And I can never answer this question. I believe that photography is always unfinished, like, I don't know. And I'm not stressed about not knowing that. But the book helped somehow to kind of... A work of art is never finished. It's merely abandoned. And I think, again, yours, you're not starting one project and starting something brand new. Yours is a continuation because the stuff, it's what you're looking at. So it's, it is different than most people's photography because often it's like, okay, computer by, you know, Radiohead, it's a great second album, and then you want the next one, oh, I start to miss that one. But what you're doing is, it's not like you're coming to me with a different project and sort of, uh, mm. this still is not as good as that one at all, and that subject matter was a bit weak. It's, yours is an ongoing thing. So it's quite unique in that respect. Mm -hmm. So the another thing that I do with, when I start working with photographers and doing books is, uh, we talk about the next project, because photographers, it's a singular practice, as we know, and you have to trust the person who's editing and looking at your work. And once you get that trust, you tend to work again with the photographer again and again, because there's a, there's a, a relationship that starts to build, uh, which is very good. So then I tend to start to look at work as you're going along, which is what you came and showed me a, couple of, a year and a half ago, I think. Um, you showed me some work of the new work, mm -hmm. and we talked about the pictures and why this works and why this doesn't work. And it's not about I like it or I don't like it. It's about this picture is strong and it's saying something and it's, it has that thing, that magic thing that good photography should have and most photography doesn't. Yeah, eventually, I mean, I don't know how we go with time, but I think that's, I that's a great kind of ending note. Seconds. We're good. <laughs> in a way, I feel that it's so much sometimes, like, in terms of image making, it's so much we're in our own heads about our own narratives, as you said. And then eventually it's all about the images. Sometimes there's people that make amazing images, but then they can't tell you what the work is about. And, you know, it's like really magical. And I think this happens across many different disciplines, and that's how, in a way, builds a momentum around the practice, and someone works for years around these type of things. And in photography, we have like this thing about projects, which definitely I have sometimes, as you say, kind of struggled with. Because yeah, for me, it's like a practice, and the practice keeps on going, and there's certain, you know, things underpinning those processes and concerns along the way. So, so definitely, I mean, like for me, the book has been a very different way of um, of having worked with this because it is a creative epilogue sometimes for me of something. Like making that book is, is really sharing this work in a, in a very different manner than just in an exhibition. But yeah, moving forward, it would be it would be interesting to see what happens. I've been thinking, I mean, definitely what you mentioned about archives, you know, there is also within photography, there's the different ways and kind of interests and, you know, um, archives definitely, it's, it's a very relevant topic, but then this makes it sometimes very hard to, you know, to commit to making work that without thinking that your work has to be different than other people, saying sincere to your practice, but also knowing that there's a lot out there around the things you're also making, and being aware of that, so, yeah, definitely it's going to... So when you come and show me the pictures, you know, if it's no good, I'll set them in Spanish. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, not, really it's not a done deal, so you know, <laughs> get ready for it.
uh, please just stick your hand up and I'll come around with the microphone. Thank you. Easy one in front. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, it's great to hear how you collaborated as well. I heard a lot about the project from you, Joanna. I have a question for each one, I think that's not too much. Um, I, I wonder if you can speak a little bit more about a particular set of photographs. Um, and I'll tell you where I'm coming from, because I'm very still influenced by Rena Papastil's work, which you saw downstairs briefly, who, which, she works very much with the surface of the city, buildings and, and walls and cracks. And I started noticing for the first time, although I've seen your book and I've seen your work, that you have this the, the particular motif with the women's background, so the, sh the shadow, the outline, and then there is some material substance behind it. Not, most normally there are walls or cracks. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your approach there, because you, you must have found something in that sort of pattern mm -hmm. that was interesting, perhaps culturally, perhaps aesthetically, or something. Yeah. No, certainly. I think this process of like, because all the silhouettes come from the original portraits of the Moomers. So I've been thinking how I moved from the real to this imagined. And I spoke a lot about ruptures, but also there's a lot around fragmentation. And you know, pieces kind of coming together, but also the process of speaking about what's missing. Um, and I think texture and layers is something that does that, uh, I mean, conceptually, as well as in terms of how I've been working um, deriving from a kind of analog photography image to re-scanning those, re-photographing those, uh, kind of doing digital collage in few occasions, kind of manual processes, and bringing all those layers back together, and how this reflects to the process of, of really this being, you know, reworked. It is something that has been reconstructed. Um, it comes from what I've experienced putting myself, you know, in those places of rituals, but then it's not about those places, and it's not about me, and it's not about the women, it's about making something out of that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's what I briefly said while entering the exhibition of Renan, that, that definitely the, the idea of collecting fragments and putting those back together into the work, it's very interesting that in my case, I begin with a photograph. So I begin with something, and then that becomes my canvas for making something else. I guess in her case, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware, is that she collects the fragments from the outside and then she builds a hole. That is always questioned in terms of what yeah, the hole is. But yeah, in my case, I begin with that very stable thing, and then I kind of deconstruct maybe and reconstruct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when we had this quick chat down there before the talk started, I didn't you said it, but I didn't really picture it, and it was only through seeing the work again I really understood what you were trying to tell me. Yeah. yeah in a minute. <laughs> Thank you. And so, Stuart, uh, a question for you obviously relates to your practice, or selection practice, and understanding all these different people who come to you. With Ioana's work, uh, presumably you possibly were not um, aware of the cultural context, perhaps of the oh, specifics. Cool. Yeah. So did the conversation, were the conversations between you and Joanna, perhaps her explaining, sort of guided you to, in the end, understanding the pictures, or you just went straight with what you were actually seeing? Um, no, I, I wear my ignorance like a badge. Mm -hmm. I, um, it, it's, it's interesting, and I listen to stories, and but the truth is, it's not the story, the truth is I look at um, the pictures, and that's, that's yeah. the thing, it's the beginning and end. I mostly don't read text about if people come with text, I don't read it. I, I respond with pictures, and that's the key for me. If that works, then everything else can work. <coughs> if that doesn't, then we're going to have to make a silk purse out of sales here, and that's really tricky. And if you look at a lot of photo books, it's just that. Um, I'm, I'm very straight now, but I look at a lot of photo books, and I think if the pictures don't work for me and speak to me, then um, it doesn't matter how much you dress it up, I'm not going to. It's not going to work. We can talk a lot about stuff and build it up and be quite academic and put a lot of theories, but the pictures just can be just plain boring. And really, that, but that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. So yeah. Thank you. And was the editing process also well, the sequencing that was done in collaboration, or the yeah. artist took a lead? Or, yeah. yeah. We do it. We do it together. And again, the whole point with this book is that I feel it flows. That's why colour is very important, and why some of the pictures you go colour things and then portraits. If I put all the portraits or the silhouettes together, 
you start, it starts to get a little dry. And what you've got to do is get this flow through books. And books are tricky things. They seem like they're simple, but they're really tricky. And again, I can tell you many books that I've looked at and where they go wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What were I think? It's a brilliant book. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Great job. Thank you so much. There's a question in the back. Sorry. What do you bring around? You mean the, the image of mix? Uh, the woman uh, from behind. The yeah. <coughs> yeah, I think it was a kind of editing, editing choice that um, was made. It was a kind of very important image in the work, and it was kind of reminded through the book. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure if it was. It's the same image, is it? It's not quite the same. Is it that I don't think it's... I must have made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think... Um, I'm not quite sure. Like, I think um, the images kind of repeat themselves. Um, but I'm not quite sure if it comes in twice. We can look... Yeah, we can look... We're all going to go back to yeah. the book now, yeah. and, um, oh, cool. but yeah, it's, it's, it makes us curious to look back at the copy. Um, but yeah, coming back to the, the question that you asked, like the text is something that we added completely in the end. It's something that for me, for instance, was very, very important, but I never introduced to you till the very end of the book, because I knew that if you had the text, then we would think about the text in relation to the images. And then we worked in this very clean design back and forth many times, and then I said, oh, by the way, there's that text. <laughs> and I was very open in terms of if you, if you would say, you know, this text, based on what we have, I don't see it at all kind of fitting in. I was also ready to reconsider, but then the text finally is in the book. And it's, it's a very open text, it's not a text telling us what the work is about. So I think... No, I think yeah. it did, in the end. And it, it did, uh, it, w it was fine. A lot of text, when I, I do kind of talk to photographers and try and get rid of it, especially poems, um, just, just to warn people about it. But um, it's, the trouble is, there are roads, that paths that people go down, and it, it just becomes so so obvious, and what I'm looking for is something sublime and something different. So your text, actually I could read it all the way through without getting bored, which is, again, my remit yes. of everything to do with that. Um, and it's, again, it's my, just me. So if I read it and I've read the, third, the sentence three times because I've pushed it off, then I know we've got a bit of an issue we need to work on it. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't. But again, writing about your own pictures or somebody writing about pictures in a book, I, I, I struggle with that too, because um, don't tell me what's going on, if I can see it. Uh, what I really want is you to look at a third way or give me some other thing, some other idea or something oblique that is starting from that. Then we start to get another, you look at the pictures, you get something, because I will get a reading from the picture and somebody else will get a different reading. So what the text has to do is provide another bit, but not explain the picture because that starts to get a bit more. Oh yeah, and you weren't doing that. Mm -hmm. Although it was a lot of work. Was it 50,000? Yeah, it was, it's actually my thesis from the Royal Conscience. But it's, it's not a thesis, it's a creative writing. Now I know. Because they're all going to work, so it's like, it's a, it's a creative writing thesis. No, yes, 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 it's, not, it's not like a thesis. It doesn't read like a thesis. No, no, but no. yeah. I know thesis sounds very heavy. This sounds very heavy. I think we've got quite a few questions now. I might just start in the back and then work my way up. <laughs> I've got quite a quick one. Um, can you talk a little bit about your decision? Hello, Hi. Um, Hi. 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 Um, I just wanted to know a little bit about your uh, decision to do a PhD. Sorry if it's a bit of a more boring question, but did you like have 
the material beforehand and then decide to go into the PhD, like knowing what you wanted to like have before exploring or yeah. Mm. I'm still figuring it out. Um, I mentioned the writing because the writing was very important for me in the process of making this work. Um, I think it's a space that I struggle a lot more than my images. It's, it's, it's a place that I'm extremely uncomfortable with and I feel it's, it's a very... It is part, it is part of my making. Uh, I don't necessarily make it you know, part of my exhibitions. I do consider you know, what writing does to a viewer. That is very different than the process of engaging with images. Um, and I've been actually looking through my PhD a lot on fragmentary writing, which that's the departure point of that. So definitely this writing within an academic context uh, in relation to my practice, because my PhD is practice-led, made a lot of sense in terms of exploring that further. Um, in terms of like, I, I didn't have the material um, as such, because the PhD was just um, you know, a departure point into engaging further with the writing and the archives and, you know, family history, but also putting that, you know, challenging that through more, a kind of more interdisciplinary context. Um, so it's definitely been a very, a very interesting process, but um, it's also about, you know, it's, it's a very academic endeavor and you also have to separate throughout the way, you know, your ways of making and your own work and, you know, your artistic kind of drive in relation to a very academic and didactic way of presenting your work, speaking about it, and um, so, yeah, there's always those two strands that don't have to be kind of conflicting within the PC. I think they're, they're very interesting. I mean, if it's something I could continue doing in terms of, like, researching and making work and yeah. allowing people to enter that universe of my writing without as to mention, like this becoming something you know too heavy or too you know in incomprehensible or you know pushing them away from the work would be something I would love to do because it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a small question. Hi, my question is again for Yana. Sorry, I you know, thank you for sharing your work and um, I would say your storytelling approach lens and on this very interesting theme. Um, I, I, I was wondering if you can share with us, you mentioned researching um, uh, professional mourners uh, in Mali, mm -hmm. right? And um, working with them on them. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. How did you interact with them? Um, how did you embed yourself mm -hmm. in their process. There's this incredible picture with the multiple uh, mourners uh, that you showed us. And if it, if it wasn't for the truthfulness in, in, in their faces, uh, one would say it's almost staged. So because you're part of the ritual, so mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's a very interesting one because for me, eventually, this experience with the mourners was all about being part of, you know, this space of the rituals and what that does to you, this idea of kind of bodies and emotions performing around death and how I kind of, I would say, gathered that energy and brought it back to my own images. Um, I, I would say that it was not very easy for me. Um, I'm from Greece, but I'm not from that part of Greece, so when I did arrive in Mani, uh, people were a bit skeptical and a bit suspicious. <coughs> I found myself hanging out in those old men cafes and kind of asking where the women are and how to approach people. And they were like, where are you from? What are you doing here? What do you want? But then I think the fact that I wasn't so confident or certain about what I was doing allowed people to actually let me into their homes. And I just said, you know, I have lost my father, I'm looking into this and I would like to spend time with you. And this helped us communicate with one another. I mean, the women are very, very old. Um, I wasn't very ambitious with the type of images I would make because in some of the cases, it's not like I could stage anything. Some of the women were 95 year old and you know, that we wouldn't even be able to hear or communicate in a manner that I would do something conceptual with them or in such a thing. And that was not really the... So I was going with what was given to me 
And actually the image that you saw of the, the funeral is an image I would have never made if I wasn't, you know, invited by the people to do so. <coughs> so actually there's an entire recording of the ceremony. Um, and it was, it was a very, a very strange thing to photograph a funeral and uh, but but the people were carrying a certain sort of pride in terms of what they were performing and I had already been allowed to be, be part of you know their community and the village so it is definitely a moment of trust um, and I remember it was the the younger boy that had lost his grandma who is the woman on the open in the open coffin that he said you know I would like to have a photograph of that which is something actually very interesting in terms of um, yeah, someone wanting to, to have an image of, of the death of a loved one. Um, in Greece, it's, it's kind of, I would say, in my opinion, very strict and very formal. I think I mentioned the funeral of my father. It's probably the first funeral I had ever been. Um, it's, it's very formal. It's, it's very different to different religions. I think you know people act in a certain way they follow rituals, they follow procedure, they, and yeah, photographing within a church, you know, is not, um, yeah, it's a strange thing to do. So I was, um, it so trust, um, and it so that those people somehow wanted to be part of the work, they had believed in what I was doing, and they also wanted, you know, to keep something out of this. So I think I would approach this project very different now. I think I've learned a lot throughout this process. In a way, I'm, I'm making a new work that is more like creative documentary work, and I find myself engaging with communities and people in a very, very different manner than back then. Um, but definitely, being Greece, it, it helped, but it also set a very different kind of... Um, a very different type of behavior and context around the people because many people, especially when the work was published, had reached out to me and they said, you know, I'm a filmmaker and I want to go and find those people and, you know, and they, they encountered a lot of struggles. But I can say that as a Greek, Greek, I also did. I mean, the women are really strong and very, very, you know, opinionated and really um, entering their space, you know, with this type of works is that if people, you know, they don't see value in what you're doing and, or they don't, you know, you can't really do it. I don't present myself as a, like a, a documentary photographer that I go, so people sometimes struggle in terms of, okay, but wh what is this for? What you're going to be doing? Like, you know, so, um, yeah, it's an interesting one. I think as long as you stay honest about what you can do and there is a kind of good communication with the people, something can come out of it. But. Yeah, I remember it was not a very easy one. I was in my first visit in Mani. I had stayed for a week and then in the end I was like, I remember I was like calling my family and I was like, well, I haven't met anyone. Like, I can't just keep on hanging around to see if the women are here. And then eventually someone saw trust and he took me to introduce <coughs> me to people. And so, yeah, there was a lot of um, persistence. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So I'm sorry, I'm just conscious of time for yeah. the little things to off to. So we'll just take two more quickly. Um, I was wondering, um, I know that you have also worked with embroidery for this project. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, the main question is why have you decided not to include the embroidery into the book? And also, if you could just speak a little bit more about the process of the embroidery. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, well, do you want to answer why we didn't include the embroidery in the book first? Uh, no, I don't, I don't remember why we didn't. So you have to answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it was also my own decision that, you know, the book is not about including everything. That's, that's not really the point of the book. I think the embroidery, if we were to include embroidery in the book, this would have to be, in my opinion, a handmade book, that there is some sort of, you know, relation between paper and textile and stitching, and there's something there. So the embroidery piece is actually is, is an interesting one. I, I didn't saw them here, but um, they really focus on the part of the archive and the ways I've been learning to embroider from my mother. 
and embroidery is a craft that I encountered quite a lot within the communities of women and then when I returned back home I told my mom that I really want to learn to embroider and eventually my skills I was really slow to to actually learn it and do it well so she kept on helping me and eventually we started making the embroideries together <coughs> and then I thought that that actually it is true how it happened and then um, that eventually the works are shared between us, it's a shared embroidery act. In my opinion, the beginning was that me, I would learn it and then I would repeat it and I would make them. Um, but yeah, it, was, it has been a very kind of intimate process of kind of sharing that with my mother, finding those images and it's something that I have developed a lot further in this new stage of the work. Working on something with her, I think that, you know, I mentioned that briefly, but I think she really, she really became a muse for me in this project, even if this always stayed in the background. Uh, you know, my mother is this very kind of Greek, traditional, but very hardcore woman. And there's, there's a lot that I've been learning from her and with her after the death of my father. And within this new narrative of the other family, you know, she's, she's also been there and kind of narrating things to me and telling me about this family secret and the embroidery actually has been almost like a dialogue between us throughout this process like when we embroider we tell stuff and we kind of exchange and eventually i think that um, the way the embroidery pieces are exhibited is the best um, way to, to share this this kind of uh, more more intimate part of the work they're quite small uh, there are as small as archival images, you know, you have to observe. I'm not quite sure how we'll do that in the book. I never suggested yeah, to eventually put embroidery in the book. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. 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 Okay.